Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode from the Avalonia UI series. In this video we'll see how to make a super simple login page. And we'll also have the opportunity to explore again some key concepts of software development like dependency injection, HTTP requests and asynchronous messaging. As usual, if you like the video and want to support the channel, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. The login system will be made of two screens, fundamentally. One with the typical username and password fields, plus a login button, and a super secret page that will be accessible only by filling the correct username and password. In case the authentication fails, we'll display an error message. All right, let's open up the solution inside our editor. And we can see that it is composed by two main folders, one for genetic files, and another one that contains all the source code. We can see three projects, a genetic one, which will contain XAML files and c -sharp files. This will be the shared project that we will work on most of the time. And then another two specific projects, an Android one and a desktop one. You can see that there's very little code inside both of them. So the first thing that we need to do for our login page is to create a secret view, a view that is accessible only after an authentication succeeds. Let's, let's create the view. Let's call it secret view. And let's just add a stack panel, a title at the top of the page and the text box that will display, let's say the authentication token, for instance, uh, something secret that we can gather after the authentication succeed like this. You can see that the text has a binding to a token property that we haven't created yet because we didn't attach, let's say, a view model to this view, which means that now we need to create the secret view model. Let's go to the view models folder and create a new one. Let's call it secret view model. Let's inherit as usual from the view model base, make it partial. Let's create a private field and mark it with the observable property attribute. This will create the property that we used as a binding in our secret view. Now let's just create a simple constructor that takes a string and assigns the token property. That's all. Let's go back to the view. Let's add the view models namespace and define the secret view model as a data type. Cool. You can see that the error is now gone. Let's rebuild and have a look at the preview. Here we go. Here's a preview of our secret page with a title and a text box that will be filled with our secret token. Now that this is done, let's move on and create the actual login view. So let's go to the views folder and create a new user control. Let's call it login view. And let's start by adding a doc panel. Based on the Avalonia documentation, the doc panel is a UI control that arranges its child controls along specified docking edges, top, bottom, left, and right, with the last child filling any remaining space, which makes it perfect for our login page, where at the top we can have some sort of page title, at the bottom we can have a login button, and then the content can be the username and password fields. But let's move on step by step. The cool thing about a doc panel is that you can add children's and mark them. So for instance, the first one that we can add is a title at the top, which will be a text block. You can see that this is a simple text block with logging as text, and it's marked with the doc panel doc attribute and set to top. Let's check the preview to have a better idea. Here we go. The title is taking all the available space now because it's the only element set as a children of the doc panel, but let's add the rest. The second element that we can add is the login button, which is at the bottom of the doc panel. In this case, I'm using a stack panel because I want a, a login button plus another text block that will show eventual error messages. So it will be hidden by default. And if there's any authentication error, then it will pop up. Just ignore the, the errors for now because we we'll still haven't declared any view model. In the stack panel, you can see that it's marked with the doc panel that doc attribute set with bottom. Now let's move on and create the actual content of the doc panel. But before we move on, let's create the login view model so that the errors are gone and the preview will show up properly. So let's go to the view models folder and create a new file. Let's call it login view model. And as usual, let's inherit from the view model base, make it partial and add the two missing properties, which are error message and 
the login command. If you remember from the previous videos, at this point we need an observable property for the error message and a relay command for the login method. So here we go with the error message and the login command that does nothing for now. So let's go back to the view and like before add the view model's namespace and set the data type for the view. Let's rebuild and you can see that now the view is starting to take a clear shape. Now what's missing is the chalk content. Let's use a stack panel for this and add two text boxes, one for the username and one for the password. Let's go back to the view model and create the username and password properties. Here we go. Let's rebuild and the error should be gone. All right, the view now looks a little bit better. And as a last element, let's add a simple combo box that will contain some predefined and valid users that we can use, which credentials we can use to properly authenticate against an external service. We got a couple of errors, but as you can see, the view is almost done at this point. What we are missing is a list of available users, which is the list of valid users that will be shown by the combo box. We have another property called selected user, which I will tell you more later. And another property called full name, which will be the text displayed in every item of the combo box. The combo box is basically a list of items. You can bind a data model for each item and you can use data from this data model to visualize any text on these items. Let's ignore the new properties for now because we'll get back to it later. All right, now that the login view is almost done, let's proceed by creating the actual login service. Of course, this is not gonna be a production ready project, so bear with me. We are doing it just to give the application a sense of concreteness. So to develop this authentication service, we can leverage the dummy JSON APIs, which is basically a service that gives you different types of REST endpoints filled with uh, some fake JSON data. And we can use them to call a real authentication endpoint like this one by leveraging a real set of users. So in short, for our solution, we need a login service that uses an HTTP client to make some REST API calls toward, towards this dummy JSON endpoints to authenticate users using username and password and get an access token. That's all. So let's create a new folder and call it services. Now let's create a new class and call it login service. The service will be responsible of making the API calls, gathering the result, parsing the result, and return a user or a generic authentication result. This service will be registered against our DI container. And to do that, we'll first create an iLogin service interface. This interface will have an authenticate method, which takes a username and a password, then returns an authentication result, and another method, users, that will fetch for us a predefined set of valid users provided by the dummy JSON service. Now let's implement the interface on our login service and implements the methods. Now, to call an API endpoint, we need an HTTP client that thanks to the DI container, we can get injected through the constructor of the login service class like this. Let's assign it to a private field so that we can use it in our methods. Now let's go on the dummy JSON website and see what we need to do to call the login endpoint. This is the reference page with all the API endpoints supported by the website. There's an out section, login and get token. At the very beginning, you can see the login user and get token. Here's a tip. You can use any user's credentials from the dummyjson.com slash users. This will be useful to fetch the valid users, which credentials we can use to log in against the platform. And from this JavaScript sample, we can see that we need to call this, this base address. The endpoint is actually auth slash login content type JSON. It's a post method. And we need to pass a body with username, password, and expiration which is optional. This will give us a JSON that we can see by clicking this output button. And this JSON will be our authentication result, which consists in a set of properties, ID, username, email, so on and so forth. Here you have the token. 
the token that we want to display inside our secret page. So with this in mind, the authentication result and the API call, let's go back to our solution and implement it using the HTTP client. So now I'll just use the primary constructor feature, which is a very cool feature available uh, in the latest version of C Sharp. So it's like having a private field and it's always injected from the constructor. I think we can even get rid of the private field at this point and have the HTTP client available. So now the first thing we can do is to create a record for this authentication result, which based on what we saw on the website, the C Sharp version should look more or less like this. We have ID, username, email, and all the properties. For the dummy user, let's go back again to the website and see the JSON that is returned from the user's endpoint. Here we go again. If we scroll down, we should have a user's category. The endpoint is users, and the result is an object with a user's field. that is an array of elements, and those items can be our dummy users. So we'll pick up just a couple of properties. We, know we don't need all, all of them. What we are interested in is username and password for sure, uh, probably first name and last name. And that's it, I think. Let's go back to the solution. And the C-sharp equivalent of the user response should be more or less this one. We have a user response, which contains a dummy user array, and the dummy user is the actual user with username, password, first name, and last name. Then we can have this artificial property, the full name, which will be handy for the combo box that we saw previously. The full name just combines the first name and the last name with a space between them. Now that we got all the models in place, let's go back to the authenticate and let's use the HTTP client to call the out slash logging endpoint. Remember that we need to pass an object in the body with the username and a password. We get them as arguments of our method. The method needs to be declared as async. And we can use this extension method that comes from the call library and the JSON content to create an HTTP content that contains a JSON. After we make the post request, let's read the response content. And if the response is successful, let's deserialize the content using specific JSON options that I declared here. Basically, we are using the camel case as the serialization policy, and we want to ignore null fields. That's it. In case the request has failed, let's just return null. The user's method on its turn, it's a little bit more simple because it's a get request towards the user's endpoint, and we need to get a JSON from there. So we can leverage the get from JSON async that does everything for us, makes the request, reads the content, deserialize the body. And as before, let's return the users in case of success, otherwise an empty array. And that should be it for our login service. Now let's go back to the login view model to finish it. The first thing that we need is to get the iLogin service injected in our constructor. Now let's go to the login method. And when the login button is clicked, we want to authenticate against the login service using username and password where the values are taken from the text boxes that we declared inside the view inspect the result if it's null it means that there was an error and we can set the error message so that it appears on the view and gives the user an actual feedback of what's going on if it was successful for now let's just wipe the error message we'll see later how to navigate from the login page to the secret page now let's create a method to fill the combo box with valid users. Let's create the available users list and the selected user. The selected user property is important because whenever the user selects a valid user from the combo box from the list of valid users, this user will be assigned as a data model itself within the combo box. So we, we have this value, we can use this value, which means that we can use the username and the password contained inside the dumb user data. So we can take that username and that password and we can fill the username and the password fields in our view. So basically you select the user and automatically you get username and password fields. So you just need to click login and you will have a valid login. And to make sure that this happens, that when you click on a user in the combo box, you get the fields automatically filled, 
we can leverage the unselected user changed method. Now you can see that this method is marked as partial. That's because every time you mark a private field with the observable property attribute, you get a bunch of code that gets auto-generated. The username is an example. So you can see that this is all auto-generated code from the community toolkit MVVM package. This is for the username. And you can see that together with the property, we also get a bunch of methods like this one on username changed. And you get one of these methods for every property. So the password will have on password changed. The available users will get on available users changed. And you can start seeing a pattern here. So for the selected user, we will have an unselected sorry an unselected user changed and if we click on this you can see that this is a partial method which means that we can declare our own code that will be called when this property changes so let's go back to the view model now you should better understand what's going on here so when the selected user changes we get this method called and you get the new value passed as an argument so always check for null values and then from this value which is a dumb user which is actually the selected user from the combo box, you can fetch the username and the password, and then you can use them to fill the username and the password text boxes. That's it. At this point, we should have more or less everything to keep moving. Oh yes, one more thing. We just want to pre-populate the users when the view gets displayed. So inside our constructor, we can call the get users, forget about the result because the get users is just going to call the login service, fetch the users and assign them to the available users. This available users property, if you remember, was assigned to the item source for the combo box. So now to complete the flow, we just need to go back to the login view and add the missing properties from the combo box. One is the item source, which has a binding to the available users property that are pre-populated when the view gets displayed and a selected item, which has a binding to the selected user property. This way, the combo box knows what to assign when an item is selected. In our case, it's going to be a dummy user with the username and the password. One last thing before we move on, let's not forget to bind the full name property of the dummy users. Pay attention to this because while the login view model is the view model of the entire view in the inside the combo box. Once you assign the item source to the available users in this case, so you get an array. So this is an array of dummy user. If you specify an item template with a data template tag inside the combo box, you can leverage the dummy user view model in this case. And the dummy user view model has this full name property that we declared before. All right. I've just realized that the video might get too long, so we'll split it in two parts. The second one should come out very soon, and we'll see how to register views and view models inside the DI container. Plus, we'll also create a messaging system to make the views communicate with each other. See you in the next video.